afternoon, good evening, everyone, from wherever you are. And it's a great pleasure to have you today connecting with us. And I thank uh, each of you and everyone for taking time to be here with us today to exchange on the animal genetic resources on, of uh, Southern Africa and their biobanking using stem cells technologies. So I'm Christian Tiambu Tiambu from the Center for Tropical Astrogenetic and Health at Ilri in Nairobi. And I'll be co-convening this uh, webinar with uh, Dr. Wanmene Esatu from the Tropical Poultry Genetic Solution from the at Ilri Addis Ababa and Dr. Musa Hassan from the Rosley Institute, University of Edinburgh at the, um, in the UK. So today we have a wonderful lineup of panelists and experts. We first will uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Paul Butcher from FAO. We'll have uh, uh, Mary Bore Karuki from AUIBA, who should be joining us. We have Prof. Farai Mushade from the Agricultural Research Council of Johannesburg in Southern Africa. And we have also Dr. Moreri from the Ministry of Agriculture, Department of Agricultural Research in the Gaborone in Botswana. We are also expecting to have Dr. Chiniko Edward from the University of Zimbabwe. And I will be replacing, substituting Dr. Jun Hu from the Rosling Institute, who is currently involved in another training on biobanking in China. Then we have uh, both uh, Tom Borden from the Rosling Institute and Dr. Hamad Meyer from the GIZ ABS Capacity Development Initiative, who should be assisted also by uh, Mrs. Effie Kayamba from the Environmental and Occupational Health and Safety at the International Livestock Research Institute. So uh, this webinar should be structured as follows. We'll have first two presentations from our multilateral and regional collaborators. This is FAO and uh, AUIBA, and this will be followed by uh, a Q&A session. Then the second Q&A session will, be, will come after the presentation from our national partners from South Africa, Botswana, and Zimbabwe. Then the third one should be after the presentation from the livestock technology expert. This is uh, uh, Prof. Dumbledon and uh, John Hu that I represent, and will be also the compliance expert led by Dr. Uh, Hamot Meyer from GRZ and Efi Kemba from Ilri. So you are most welcome. Please feel free to use your chat the chat box to introduce your question, to introduce yourself using the Q&A question also, and your institution as well. And uh, uh, for the presenter, please, you are used to, uh, you are free to use your camera to when you are talking. And for the, the, of course, the webinar will be recorded and the recording will be shared later to all the participants and uh, also will be available on our platform, communication platform at ILRI and partners institutions. Okay, and uh, before we continue, I will allow uh, Dr. Musa to introduce the context of this webinar. Musa, please. Uh, thank you, Christian, and uh, welcome everybody to this webinar. And uh, wherever you are, depending on the time, good morning, good afternoon. Now, one of the greatest resources in Africa is its rich diversity of indigenous uh, animal genetic uh, 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 resources. And most of these are essential for food security and poverty alleviations to millions that live within the continent. But besides uh, food security and poverty alleviation, some of these indigenous animals also possess unique adaptive traits, which include tolerance to disease and pests, tolerance to heat, feed, and water shortages, and the ability to cover long distances in search of pastoral resources. So the indigenous breeds, in essence, serve as distinct uses in economic, social, and cultural aspects in the African context. However, due to a variety of reasons, uh, these indigenous resources are now uh, are threatened by extinction. And, and one of the ways to, to avoid this is through, uh, to avoid or to, to mitigate this threat is through uh, conservation of these resources. And especially in the face of climate change, this becomes even more imperative. 
And we argue that this can be achieved through integrated approaches, which include both in situ and ex situ conservation strategies, as well as a package of services for top, uh, supporting farming practices. As a result, in recent years, through the support of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the UK Foreign and Commonwealth, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, CTLGH, which is a creation between the ILRI, SRUC, which is a Scottish Royal uh, University College and the University of Edinburgh through the Roslyn Institute, have established and piloted several innovative protocols for conservation of animal genetic resources using the stem cell approach. Deployment of some of these protocols have start, started in collaboration with AU IBA and is being extended with ILRIS farmer facing programs like TTGS, which is the Tropical Poultry Game Services, and ABDG, and African National Partners for the CGIR Sapling Initiatives. Now, this webinar is a preparatory to the regional wet lab biobanking training for so South Africa and the CTLGH2. So, this is the second funding phase of CTLGH, aiming to present and familiarize participants with the gene bank operations, crime preservations, and restorations of local animal genetic resources using stem cell technologies, and to contribute to the strengthening capacities for conservation practices and sustainable use of local and locally adapted animal genetic resources and uh, CTLGH and its partner institutions, which, as I said, include Roslyn, SRUC, and Hillary. So I believe that by participating in this webinar, we are in the right place and the right time, and together we can all accelerate the exchange of ideas and methods to scale up uh, good practices in conservation of animal genetic resources. So I will give it back to Christian, who is going to introduce our first uh, presenter, and then we can get on with the, with the webinar. Christian. Thank you very much, uh, Musa. And today our first presenter is Paul, Paul Butcher from FAO. Paul is already online and uh, while he's loading his presentation, allow me to introduce you to the participant. So Paul is an animal production officer and uh, has been working for more than 14 years as the food, uh, ag food uh, and agriculture organizations at the United Nations FAO in Rome, Italy, within the animal production and health division. He has worked as an uh, outposted officer of the FAO IEA Division of Nuclear Technique in Food and Agriculture at the headquarters of the International Atomic uh, Energy Agency in Vienna, Austria. And the primary activities of his work is to support countries to implement the Global Action Plan for Animal Genetic Resources with a particular emphasis on conservation and uh, on applications of biotechnologies. And this is uh, also one of the main reasons why Thomas being one of our main key players throughout this journey on capacitating the NAS, capacitating the regional and international institutions in making sure that conservation is properly done and the resources are used, the technologies are used to fit the purpose and to meet the demand from the ground. So Paul has previously worked as a research scientist in Canada and Italy, and of course in uh, the International At Atomic Energy Agency, as I mentioned, and he has authored and co-authored more than 200 scientific publications on these issues of genetic resources. And uh, he also currently serves as uh, the Secretary of the Intergovernmental Inter Technical Working Group for Animal Genetic Resources within the Commission of Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. And today, Paul will be introducing to us the new FAO uh, guideline on conservations and genomic characterizations and the domestic animal diversity information system that is, which is supporting conservations and sustainable utilizations of animal genetic resources across uh, the world. Please, uh, um, Paul, you have the floor. I'd like to start off by just thanking Christian for the invitation for me to speak on 
our new FAO guidelines for the management of animal genetic resources. In addition, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of my colleagues, Roswitha Baumung and Greg Wildow in the preparation of this presentation. So I think all of you probably know this, but why are animal genetic resources important? Well, they form an essential part of the biological basis for world food security. This is because more than 1 billion people rely directly on livestock for a major proportion of their livelihoods, and several other beings are involved in livestock value chains. Therefore, a diverse resource base is critical to eradicate world hunger. Genetic diversity of livestock breeds allows the species to adapt to current and future environmental constraints, and it also serves as the raw material for breeders to make genetic improvement. Although breeds are considered club goods, individual or sovereign to countries, this genetic diversity is uh, essentially considered international public good, given that you know, a lot of the genes, genetic information is shared by breeds across borders. And therefore, there's a logical role in the UN in the form of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN in global coordination in the management of this genetic diversity. So what are the roles and responsibilities of FAO? That was mentioned by Christian, we collaborate with member countries to support country-driven efforts to implement the Global Plan of Action for Animal Genetic Resources. The Global Plan of Action is the only internationally developed and adopted plan to improve the management of the world's animal genetic resources. It was developed through a multi-country you know, process and then endorsed by FAO conference, you know, the meeting of FAO member countries in 2007, and then reaffirmed also in the FAO conference in 2017. The Global Plan of Action contains 23 different strategic priorities for action, which aim to address current and future challenges to the livestock sector. These 23 different strategic priorities are assigned to one of four different priority areas. The first of which is characterization, inventory, and monitoring. The second, sustainable use and development. The third, conservation. And the fourth, policies, institutions, and capacity building, which really underlies the application of the first three strategic priority areas. Additional roles and responsibilities are that FAO monitors the status of implementation of this global plan of action. FAO also monitors the state of the global animal genetic resources based on inputs from countries. And therefore, this is in some ways to look at the indirect impact of implementation of the Global Plan of Action. We also try to raise awareness and promote animal genetic resources issues internationally. Another responsibility is to establish or strengthen international information sharing, research, and education. One example in how we do that is the is DATIS, the Domestic Animal Diversity Information System. Just to give you a bit more information on that, DATIS serves as a web interface for the global database of livestock breeds. It currently has information for nearly 9,000 different breeds from 37 different species, and managed bees was recently added to DATIS. This database allows countries to document the presence of livestock breeds and species as well as their valid relatives in their country and then describe their characteristic. It serves as the Convention of Biological Diversity's clearinghouse mechanism for the diversity of animal genetic resources. And is also the source of data for strategic or sustainable development goal indicators 2.51 and 2.52, which deal with you know, XC2 and in C2 conservation respectively. So this slide shows some screenshots of DATIS. The first in the upper left hand is the homepage of DATIS. Uh, the one in the upper right 
shows an example, you know, from here in the, in the Southern Africa of a goat, you know, of information for a breed. And the final in the bottom shows an example of how data can be used to pre prepare and present different graphs and other sorts of figures. Among the other roles and responsibilities are to promote international cooperation and develop partnerships among countries, and then participate like I'm doing today in events that partners arrange. We build capacity through training workshops, which includes not only those from FA, but also those by our partners. And then we provide technical support to countries in a variety of different ways. For example, implementing and backstopping projects, developing international technical standards and protocols, and then producing technical guidance. And this final uh, method of support is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my presentation. Among the strategic priorities for the Global Plan of Action is to develop international technical standards and protocols. This is important because some countries may lack knowledge or the familiarity with the most effective and up-to-date methods and protocols for the management of animal genetic resources. So guidelines can help you know, build capacity. And also application of standardized approaches facilitates information sharing and cooperation and evaluation of implementation across countries. FAO has collaborated with experts from around the world to develop a collection of technical guidelines. This slide shows an example of the ones that have been developed in the past. We have, there are eight or nine different guidelines that are assigned to various strategic priority areas and then one overarching guidelines on preparing national strategies and action plans. Most of these guidelines were developed soon after the adoption of the Global Plan of Action in 2007. They do, however, remain fully applicable in most cases. However, in other instances, technology had advanced rapidly so that updating the guidelines has become warranted. For example, in cryoconservation or ex situ in vitro conservation, genomics, reproductive physiology, and cryobiology, those tech technologies have advanced, as well as there's been more effort in utilizing material in gene banks rather than just supporting as a way to you know, save breeds or prevent breeds from extinction. With molecular genetic characterization, of course, genomics has advanced greatly in, in the last 10 years, as well as analytical methods for the associated data. And therefore, FAO over the last couple of years has developed new guidelines on these two topics. So this slide just shows the you know, cover pages of the two different guidelines. Regarding innovations in cryoconservation, from 2016 to 2020, FAO was a partner in the European Union Horizon 2020 research project entitled IMAGE, where IMAGE stands for Innovative Management of Animal Genetic Resources. IMAGE, as you can imagine, generated numerous research results for improving cryoconservation programs. One of the deliverables of, of IMAGE was an assessment of the previous FAO guidelines on cryoconservations and proposal of contents for an updated version. Scientists from Image Partner, therefore, served as co-authors of each chapter of these guidelines, although we matched them with non-Image scientists to ensure a global perspective, not just you know, European focus. And then scientists from the Nordic Genetic Resources Center, also known as Norgen, were also partners of Image, and they served as co-editors of the guidelines. As far as the Contents, I'm not going to give a lot of detail on the authors, but at least explain the contents. First, we start out with building a gene banking strategy, which of course should be the basis for all subsequent actions. Chapter two deals with implementation and organization and looks into quality management of gene banks. Section three regards the choice of biological material, 
such as semen, embryos, uh, stem cells, and so forth. Four, look, chapter four looks at the economics of gene banking, concerning not only the cost, but also the returns on investments. Section five looks at de developing and using collections and comparing to the previous guideline, looks more into using genomics in management of collections. Section six updates new methods for collection and cryopreservation of germplasmid tissue. Section seven looks at sanitary issues because these are important not to cryopreserve you know, pathogens along with your genetic material. Section eight is on databases and documentation, given that the information associated with samples is more and more becoming just as important as the samples themselves. Nine is on legal issues, such as the Goya protocol, and 10 is on capacity building and training. Moving on to genomic characterization, FAO has had a long history of cooperation with International Society of Animal Genetics, better known as ISAG. And in fact, ISAG is a standing committee called the ISAG FAO Advisory Group on Animal Genetic Resources. Members of this advisory group have led development of previous FAO guidelines, leading back as far as 30 years ago. This started with secondary guidelines on the management of, animal, of domestic animal diversity, looking at when the first application of molecular genetics in characterization. Then the, there's a decision to develop recommended microsatellite markers to standardize procedures, which was released in 2004. And then we also work with FAO or with ISAG members in developing guidelines in molecular characterization in 2011. Therefore, it is natural to have current and past members of this advisory group to serve as editors for the new guidelines. And these editors also chose authors for specific topics, many of whom were also ISAG members. So just give an overview of the content. It starts out with an introduction, which you know, backs up the rationale of characterization of livestock populations and looks at future prospects. It then goes into the basics of upstream planning for molecular genetic characterization studies. Section three is on genomic tools and methods, which gives an overview of the approaches such as you know, genome sequencing, uh, use of SNP chips, genotyping by sequencing, and then imputation from a lower level of information to a greater level of information. Section four is applying you know, the new genomic methods for evaluating genetic diversity and looks at approaches for both within breed and across breed studies. And there are also several different uh, appendices which give more details on topics in these four chapters. So in conclusion, animal genetic resources are an important public good for food security. FEO members have an intergovernmental process for assessing the management of global animal genetic resources, which is guided by the Global Plan of Action for Animal Genetic Resources. Individual countries bear the, bear the main responsibility for AM for implementation of the Global Plan of Action, but FAO provides technical assistance to countries and then monitors the status of animal genetic resources and the status of implementation of the Global Plan of Action. New guidelines on crowd conservation and genomic characterization have been prepared by international experts and were made available online in January of this year. This shows the two different uh, you know, the URL for these guidelines, they're only available online, although we're developing now ebook formats. And because this, these slides will be shared, you can just use these links at a later time. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I will pass the, you know, stop sharing and pass the floor back to Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, for this tool that uh, you are valuing to us and to the end users, 
to the managers of the regional gene banks to ensure the sustainability and um, efficient use of genetic resources we have uh, in the region. And as uh, Musa mentioned at the beginning, this webinar is to really prepare the regions to the upcoming wet lab training on biobanking using the stem cells technologies. And we are supposed to have uh, Mary Bole Karuki from AUIBA. I'm told from the, their office that she is still involved in another meeting and she's not yet free. But while waiting for her to join us, I will request uh, Dr. Farah to uh, step in and uh, make her presentation, if that is okay for you. Prof. Farah, are you okay? Yeah, that is okay. I'll share my presentation shortly. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So while uh, Dr. Farah is sharing the presentation, allow me to introduce her. So um, she is a senior manager for research and biotechnology platform at the Agricultural Research Council in South Africa. And uh, she also leads the Animal Genetics and Genomic Research Group at the biotechnology platform, managing various projects on livestock and wildlife genomics. And uh, her research interests are on the, in characterization, sustainable utilization, and conservations of uh, livestock genetic resources. And currently she is also involved, she also involved the applications of genomics and the population genetic tools in unraveling the genetic diversity and identifying adaptive feature associated with livestock species from marginalized uh, farming environment. And she is passionate about investigating how the genetic adaptations can be harnessed into mainstream uh, agriculture. So this is one of the key person, persons we have in the Southern African regions to support us in conservation and sustainable use of genetic resources. She has a very vast experience in characterization of genetic resources. And today she will be talking with, uh, to us about local poultry genetic resources in Southern Africa and their conservation status. Please, uh, Farah, you have the floor. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Christian, uh, and good day, everybody. So as indicated, I'll talk about the local poultry genetic resources in Southern Africa and their conservation status, particularly as we build towards this initiative of cryopreservation and more targeted conservation strategies. So uh, I think uh, for us, if we look at poultry genetic resources, there they are quite a number of uh, facts on the table uh, that really needs to be considered when we look at their conservation. One is if we look at the, what's happening in Africa, in most countries, poultry is actually considered or taken synonymous with, with chicken. Uh, a lot of information that we find categorized under poultry is chicken genetic resources, uh, putting aside other poultry species like the guinea fowl, the pigeons, ducks, turkey, geese, quails, and there is quite a list of species that are out there uh, that, that are not characterized, that are not talked about, and that are not really uh, known. Then when we look at the local chicken ecotypes, <laughs> We also find that the, the major limitation is there are no defined breeds. Uh, what we talk about is really ecotypes. For example, you know, we talk about the land in Mozambique, Swana chickens, Botswana, Ovambo, South Africa. Some countries just talk of their chicken populations as village chickens, local chickens, or ecotypes. Uh, in some countries where they've made efforts to, to define them, they are really defined around major genes or major uh, morphological traits. Like we know about the naked neck, which we know that is a major gene, but it is being taken synonymous as a breed as well. Dwarfism and many other morphological traits that are associated with these chickens. What this really says is we, we have a problem. We have so many unknowns in terms of these poultry genetic resources. 
and is emphasized by the FAO, unknown species or breeds are as good as extinct because you can't even monitor them properly and you can't follow through whether they are uh, managed properly and their, their existence is also safeguarded. Uh, when we look at the uh, ecotypes in the chicken uh, populations within the chicken family, we also find that the information is really scant. If we look at the uh, POIS just talked about, the FAO, that is database, which really takes a lot of this information from the different countries and puts it in one platform for everyone to know what's out there. That information is scanned for chickens. Actually, chickens and poultry species are one of the species with close to zero information on country statistics. And again, lack of information is a major risk to the existence of any species. However, if we look at literature, we find that lots of work has been reported on local chicken genetic resources at a country level across countries in Africa and also outside Africa information on flock sizes, socioeconomic importance at household levels, phenotypic characterization of these populations, what uh, traits the farmers prefer and select for. There's been an increasing work on genetic characterization with the advent of genomic probe tools. We also see a lot of genomic profiles, uh, sequences, uh, genomic data on these populations. And this is actually good news. Although that information is still fragmented, it is there and it is increasing in quantity. So actually this information needs to be consolidated and see how the countries can further input into the FAO that is, but also that it would really feed into any future initiatives around their conservation and proper utilization. Uh, what ecotypes are we really talking about? I think uh, one common feature as you move on from one country to the other country is the high phenotypic diversity that you really observe in these chicken populations. Uh, they are called ecotypes, but you observe so many uh, phenotypic uh, variation that you even get to believe that you are dealing with so many uh, genetic populations. So there is also hypothetically many genotypes that we are talking about. However, one characteristic of them is that these breeds or populations are poorly described. So people really don't know. We really don't know what the boundaries are. We didn't really don't know which ones really constitute a breed or a population. And then that leaves us with the two major questions. What is it that we need to conserve and should we really need to conserve them? Uh, what we know now, I think there has been a lot of work that has been done. And like I said, with the advent of genomics, we are seeing a lot of work going into the characterization and the study of these populations. And one thing that I think we now know now is almost close to a fact is genetic diversity within and between these populations is very high. I think the picture that I'm showing there is typical of most village chicken populations where you see them differing so much from the broiler populations, the exotic established broiler populations and layer populations, which is contrary to the mean that these populations had been mixed up with the established exotic breeds. And such biodiversity really needs to be tapped into and it needs to be conserved. We now know that there are carriers of different and unique diversity from the exotic broilers and layer breeds. So they don't not only carry so much diversity, they are different from the established broiler populations. And what this also tells us that is each population or each ecotype carries unique diversity. And in terms of conserving the total biodiversity, it means that we should prioritize them and we should be able to preserve them as they add into the total uh, biodiversity. This is really important, particularly when you talk about resources allocation and making available the infrastructure and prioritizing populations. You need to make sure that there is a representation of these ecotypes and these village populations in the conserved gene pool. 
what we also know now about these populations is that they are adapted to, to local conditions. So the figures out there are studies that have been done in local chicken populations. Uh, one demonstrating that their diversity is geographically distributed in that their diversity is associated with genes that are uh, adapted or that confer resistance and adaptation to, to local conditions. And so by conserving these populations, you are really preserving genes with local adaptation. And in the event, in the advent of climate change that is um, threatening us, we really need to make sure that we know where these adapted genotypes are and pick them up and conserve them. In terms of the threats to, to their biodiversity, I think uh, one of the most pronounced one across populations is the extreme environmental conditions and com compromised production systems. And we know that poultry species are very sensitive to environmental conditions, whether it's temperature, rainfall patterns, they are also very sensitive to, to nutrition. So they demand high quality feeds. So this is a major threat to their survival. Diseases are also a major threat to their survival. The map below really shows the distribution of Newcastle disease. And we see that Africa uh, is as a whole is really challenged by Newcastle disease in Southern Africa so much. No, I never, never. The next uh, the, next, the next map shows the distribution of avian influenza, which is also affecting, you know, Southern Africa, South Africa, and parts of Zimbabwe and just north of South Africa. They are also highly affected by avian influenza. And when these two diseases affect populations, they really wipe populations, causing bottlenecks and reducing the diversity. So that's something that's also need to be managed in terms of conservation. Uh, the other threat to their biodiversity is the risk due to adoption of non-local breeds, especially in intensive chicken production system. And we see a growth in the adoption of intensive chicken production systems across uh, Africa as households try to use uh, chickens as a major source of income. Then they go and select exotic breeds as they are high yielding. And that really puts a threat on, on local breeds. Uh, the conservation status of poultries, I think, again, if we go to the FAO that is, we see that predominantly it's non-existent in African countries. Country after country, you don't get really what's happening at that uh, level. However, we know from a lot of literature, which also needs to be pulled into that, that there are some in-situ conservation practices happening at country levels. This is conservation through utilization with the local farmers, smallholder farmers acting as custodians and conserving these local genetic resources. But we have also seen the, the incoming of um, certain initiatives. If you look at the Native Chicken Project of Mozambique and Uganda, if you look at the African Chicken Genetic Gains Project by um, IORI, the CTLGH, we find that these are initiatives that are really promoting in situ conservation of these poultry uh, species by basically matching the different genotypes to the appropriate environment and promoting the farmers to use them and making sure that they are able to produce optimally and to provide that the goals that the farmers are looking for. However, these challenges that we are still um, First with is the inadequate characterization of the local chickens in most Southern African and African countries. So it is really difficult to fully understand the present diversity that could be used to formulate and implement a lot of these conservation uh, strategies through utilization. So efforts needs to be increased. There have been some efforts. Some countries are really advanced in creating an inventory of the local chickens that really being a fundamental step towards breed conservation and breeding. Our exit to conservation outside their natural habitats, and we are looking at you know, conservation in zoos, in conservation flocks or herds, in biobanks, 
And also, I think the main topic of today through cryopreservation, um, this is one way that can actually ensure or it needs to ensure that the diversity is is conserved. However, we have major limitations, particularly with poultry, but with also other species, that now you'll be maintaining these organisms in the artificial habitats. There's usually a deterioration of genetic diversity, mainly because you can't you can't capture everything. It's expensive to set up the, the structures to conserve this and to maintain them over time. So what usually you find is people assembling uh, partially and to a very small extent, the genetic diversity that's in that population, thereby leading to depression because the populations are kept outside their natural habitats. There's the adaptation to these captive or artificial environments and therefore loss of survival skills uh, for the natural uh, habitats. Uh, one good example that I have is one that has been set up uh, a long time ago by the South, uh, our South African Agricultural Research Council, which was called the Fowls for Africa program. So what that program actually did was to sample from the major phenotypes that we find in the village populations, and we had the vendor, the naked neck, the ovambo, and the other genotypes. However, that program was really challenged, like I indicated, with poor sampling. So you assume what it went in and sampled really major genotypes or interesting phenotypes. What we have seen over time is the divergence of the con conserved populations from found in field populations. The program itself is very expensive to run and it is exposed to the same risk and threats as natural populations. So some of these conserved populations have actually been lost, uh, whether it's because they couldn't be maintained anymore or they were threatened by natural diseases. We also observed reduced population sizes in these populations, and that's typical of conservation flocks because it's also very challenging and expensive to keep on adding the diversity into these uh, conservation heads. Uh, this is just an illustration of what I'm talking about, where we went in uh, a couple of years down the line and we sampled the village populations and we sampled the conservation flocks. And what you observe is a clear divergence of the two populations. The village ecotypes are now sitting on their own, separate from the conservation. And that's not what you want. When you are conserving, you need to ensure that you maintain that diversity and you'll be able to retrieve that diversity when you need it. Uh, there are other methods and initiatives around XC2, and I didn't go into detail as I thought that's the discussion in the next session of cryopreservation technologies, which if we look at poultry, it was not talked about in early years because the technologies were really challenging. It was difficult to really uh, be able to cryopreserve um, uh, poultry sperm. But however, we have seen some progress made in the last couple of years. And what we need to do is to really tap into it and make sure that it complements the in-situ conservation strategies to be able to conserve poultry diversity. I'll end here and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug, for the wonderful presentation of the situation and the context in the poultry in general and in South Africa in particular. And uh, we can see that um, despite the different methods of conservation, we still need to be very careful to ensure that uh, we are losing nothing from what is naturally conserved in the villages by our farmers. We respect the farmers who are the real custodians of the genetic resources in their natural environment. So thank you very much. And I will um, allow um, Dr. Moreri to connect. Moreri, you are there? You are muted, we can hear you. Good. Yes. Are you getting us? Uh, fortunately, we can't hear you.
Can you unmute? Yeah, there may be an issue with his uh, microphone and uh, probably we have to come back to it while uh, he's, he's trying to sort the issue. Maybe we move to, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. You can hear us, but we can't hear you at all. I don't know if you are using a uh, headset or any device, which may be closed. Okay, while waiting for him to, for Dr. Morelli to set uh, his microphone, maybe we can move to the next presentation. And uh, I will try to step on the show of uh, Dr. June from the Rosley Institute to present on his behalf. Uh, let me try to share my screen as well. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, Christian, we can see the screen. Now. Okay, thank you very much. So I hope uh, Dr. Morelli will succeed uh, very soon share, uh, setting his microphone. Then we revert to him after I present on behalf of uh, Dr. June from the Rosley Institute. And uh, June was supposed to present on the potential of primordial germ cells and surrogacy technology for conservation, restoration, and development of um, poultry genetic resources in Southern Africa. So, um, yes, so we almost all of us we know about the process since the domestications of the poultry from the wild jungle fowl in Southeast Asia and the process of specialization to obtain the more than 1,600 breeds that we have all over the world nowadays. And most of those breeds are specialized. Some are still called local, of course, but we have some which are uh, very uh, good professional, develop as layers or as uh, brawlers in the different environment. As uh, uh, Farah was mentioning just a few minutes ago, we have a great diversity of poultry genetic resources distributed across the globe. And in Africa as well, we have a great diversity of genetic resources, globally called local chicken, village chicken, etc. But when you go deeper into each community, into each agroecological zone, you may see that chickens uh, based on some phenotype or specific features they have, have been assigned different names by local community most of the time. And this may be due probably to the specific needs, how chickens are contributing to the needs of those communities or specific trade they are displaying for them. This is how we can see the vendor Ovambo and the other breed that we just saw from uh, Dr. Farai just a few minutes ago. But in different countries, we also have the same uh, uh, diversity of chicken, which are globally called local chicken. So this is a great diversity that we need to tap on to improve productivity and improve the livelihood in, in our community. <clears throat> Yeah, to improve the livelihood in our communities. Sorry. So uh, unfortunately, we can also observe in the different communities that uh, poultry production is increasingly based on the limited number of breed in different countries. 
and it means the within brain genetic diversity is dangerously declining. And we also see that most of our communities depends on meat and eggs. So they need to be rearing what we call the multiple purpose or generally the dual purpose breed. But generally in science also and at the global level, sometimes they are undervalued. Yet we know that there are trait of adaptability and resistance to some diseases are very important for us to make a sustainable poultry system for our local communities. And Dr. Farah was mentioning a few uh, minutes ago about the issue of adaptability and based on what we need to know what we are conserving in different agroecological zones. And I just wanted to write on that to present a bit this work uh, done by uh, CTH and Ilure team on the ecological niche modeling for delineating livestock ecotypes and exploring environmental uh, genomic adaptation based on the examples of the Ethiopian village chicken, where the authors clearly demonstrate that if we are looking for what we need to conserve, we need to go for adaptability trade and also preference. And from there, based on the different uh, environmental conditions, altitude, latitude, temperatures, etc., we should be able, based on the criteria that we need in the community, to identify where are the niches, where are the genetic resources that we need to convert, conserve to uh, um, meet a specific demands or to be to also to be sure that we are not losing some important genes that we may need in the future generations. And we have all the diversities. What we presented in Ethiopia can be done in the Botswana, in Malawi, in South Africa, in Lesotho, wherever we are, because we have this well-adapted ecotype in all of these regions. Unfortunately, they are under green, a great threat, many threats. And most of them, uh, the major ones can be the rapid spread of homogeneous large-scale intensive production. Of course, we want to produce for food security in the regions intensively, but that intensification of poultry productions in some areas is seriously threatening the diversity of locally, local and locally adapted ecotypes. Of course, at the country level, sometime or regional level, we may have this issue of inappropriate development of policies and management strategies to conserve what is really key to us. And the disease outbreaks like the Newcastle that was also mentioned a few minutes ago and their control strategies and various forms of disasters and emergencies. And it is because of this also that I believe some few years ago, FAO was able to uh, put in place a program called Livestock Emergency Guideline and Standard to take into consideration that there are, of course, known traits, but some also may be coming, like it can be war, it can be landslide, it can be a flood or drought, etc., which may be affecting the, this genetic diversity. And that is why we need to factor them when we are planning conservation agendas. And for chicken, Conservation is really problematic. For many other livestock and the mostly mammals, conservation, in situ conservation is very feasible. For chicken also, that is feasible. But we notice that for livestock, cattle, sheep, goat, pigs, etc., we can conserve them through eggs, uh, sperms, embryos, etc. For chicken, conserving eggs, it's absolutely impossible up to now. Conserving sperms also is feasible, but with some challenges. One of the main challenges is that so far we can see from the pictures we have here at the here at the bottom, we can see that before freezing sperms, we have just very few dead cells there, dead sperms. But after freezing, a great percentage of these animal of these uh, cells have died. It means conserving sperm for poultry may not be very efficient 
to for for sustainable uh, utilization in the future. And the second challenge is that knowing the gene genetics or the uh, um, biological uh, constraints of genetic material in the in the in the poultry, where the males are homozygotic and the females are heterozygotic. It means when conserving the sperms in poultry, we may be conserving all the genes on the Z chromosome since the male are ZZ and we are just conserving sperms. It means while conserving sperm, we should be losing the genetic information that may be carried by the W chromosomes. And that is very, very challenging for us. And we also see that while conserving and after restor restoration, we have very low fertility in the different population that may have been conserved. And also, you, even if you succeed using those ones that escape the fertility challenge, recovering, using different crossbreeding program to recover the native, the native population conserve will be really time consuming. So despite all the tools and facilities we may have for conservations of livestock in general, we still have challenges conserving poultry genetic resources, but we have now the options of using primordial germ cells, which is presenting some advantages in the fact that large diversity can be conserved in a very small place in a very small tubes and put in liquid nitrogens or other facilities that you have. And it means we can also conserve at the opposite of uh, in situ, in vivo conservation. Here we can maintain material in the free, uh, in the environment free of pathogens. If we consider what um, Paul mentioned as one of the key elements, key component of the biobanking material or conserv crowd conservation document he shared with us, being able to conserve material free of pathogens and also uh, protected against natural hazard, as I mentioned. That's why we have the livestock emergency garden as standard. And a large number of chicken can be revived when needed because now it means using the stem cells technology is possible to conserve many cells in the single tube. We can pull the material and later on it's possible to reintroduce them in the different processes through the different processes that I will present later, particularly the surrogate host technology and revive the population. So here the technologies is based on the fact that it is possible to isolate those germ cells at the earlier stages and crop preserve them and later on re-inject them into the host embryos. And from there, they should be able to uh, recolonize the gonad of the host and repopulate and at the end, we should be able to produce, the host may be producing genetic material uh, from the, the donor cells. And this is exactly what we can see here. Unfortunately, the, the, we can not see the video, but we can see on the right that the two, the five, the seven, we see how the cells, which are here shining, can be colonizing gradually the gonad and really taking place. It means the sperm cells or the eggs that should be produced by these individuals should be carrying the genetic material from the conserved population. So to do that, there have been three different methods developed. The first two were using the blaster disc or the circulating blood. That is very possible, but sometimes it can be challenging because we see that we need to be culturing and propagating the materials before we crop preserve them. This implies high cost. We need special facilities, incubators, etc. And we also need, uh, we, also, we are also undergoing the risk of genetic mutations through how the different passages, etc. And at the end, if you succeed, we should be able to cross breed the sterile host and restore the population that was crop preserved at the beginning. But 
the colleagues from Rosley Institute, particularly June and Mike Magro and their team, has been able to develop and pilot this uh, process of cow preserving embryonic gonad. These are gonad isolated on day nine, and they can be pulled and crop preserved directly without the process of culturing. It means this is low cost, can be done at the regional level in, with minimal, with uh, lab having minimal facilities. So the technology is low and we are also skipping the risk of mutations. And as I mentioned earlier, we can pull genetic material all together and be able to re-inject in the host and restore the population that we are producing. And this is what from here at Ilori, Nairobi, we have been doing with the CALRO. This is the Kenya Agricultural Livestock Research Organizations, with whom we have been able to isolate either primordial germ uh, uh, blasto disc or circulating blood or gonad from these populations. These are ecotype of Kenya of chicken in Kenya, and we have them now in the bar repository. And from time to time, we can collect them from the bar repository, re-inject them in a host. We are using as a host now the white legon eggs. And at the end, we can produce these chicks, which at the earlier stages uh, of the research now are chimeras. You can see them, the white legons, but with some level of colonizations of the uh, local chicken, and we have it at the phenotypes. And this is a work in progress, and we have a good collaboration then with CALRO, and we can also have approval from the National Biosafety Authority of Kenya to move to the next step using the surrogate host, which is a gene-edited animal. The gene edition of this animal, genetic edition of these animals, it has just been made to silence the capacity of this host to produce their own stem cells. And later on, when we re-inject the uh, cells of the donor of the local chicken, only those cells will be colonizing the gonad. It means that will not be the competition that created the chimeras. And at the end, we should be able to produce 100% pure offsprings. So, Sterile males and sterile females, chicken, eggs have been implanted with reproductive cells from donor's birth and the resulting chicks mated together to produce chicks of the donor uh, breed. This is uh, just an illustration of what is going on. This is, uh, these are pictures taken uh, from the lab and you can see the surrogate host here with the ICA space nan, this is gene edited and in a non-treated embryo, we can see that the primordial gel cells are distributed in the gonad. But with the drug-treated embryo, this is one having the BB drug, which is uh, just a, a substance which is destroying the capacity of the chicken also to, to, to produce the stem cells. We can see that now the gonads are really free of the primordial gem cells. And then when we inject the cells of the donors of the local chicken, they are able to colonize the gonad. We can see here in the male gonad, remember the males, when we are looking in the microscope, the gonads are having the same size, but in the females, you can see that difference in the size of gonad. And you can see how they are fully colonized now by the cells and to demonstrate that it is possible, the experiments are also, the chicks produced have been uh, hatched and transfer and try to breed. And we can see that the performance, first the survival is still perfect, 65 to 68% uh, survivability. And the number and sex of hatching that we have them here and the distribution, the only difference is that sometimes we need to enrich when we are having females. Remember that the females are having mostly one big gonad and the small one, while the males are having two uh, comparable uh, gonad size. It means the quantity 
of uh, cells we may be having from the males are totally different from what we may have from the females. But at the end, we have this uh, relatively uh, similar um, proportion of uh, chicks obtained at the end. And it is also demonstrated through the different lab experiment that though we are using gene edited material, the offspring we are having, 100% local chickens are having nothing of the trans genes that is produced. It means these offsprings obtain a really pure local chickens transfer, maybe we should be pure local chicken restored in the different, uh, it can be different populations or not. And these are examples of pictures, what is obtained. And you can see that this surrogate parent, males and females, which cells are being injected, this, uh, which eggs are being injected, the cells of this line are producing exactly what we uh, wanted at the beginning. The same here with this uh, uh, red braid, but producing as offspring the Sussex that was crop preserved and uh, restored from the uh, liquid nitrogen. So this is really what is going on and what is want to transfer uh, uh, from CTAGH and ILRI and the Partners Rosler Institute, University of Edinburgh, to the national system in Africa to ensure sustainability of conservations and uh, keeping exactly the material that we want. Remember, I mentioned that we are doing this in collaboration also in Kenya with CALRO. And CALRO has started a breeding program some time back, and we can see how the flock has been growing. The breeding flock at Caldo has been growing from 2018 to today, will almost 80,000 breeder on station currently. But despite the quantity of chicks they can produce and disseminate on annual basis, they are not yet able to meet the demand, the, the demand at the country level within Kenya for the different counties. So it is very important now that if we are using the both biological machinery of professional layers, remember some of those layers are producing up to 300 eggs and more per year, while our local chicken may be producing maximum 100. It means we use the body machinery of these professional layers at surrogate host, and we should be able to restore the populations and to proceed, proceed to intensive disseminations of elite locally adapted chicken genetic resources within the tropics and meet then the demands of our farmers. We also know that most of the, our farmers may not engage into professional poultry breeding because the breed we have may not be locally adapted to their production systems and to their environment. But if we have a locally uh, adapted surrogate host, it means we can even produce at high level uh, chicken genetic resources in very challenging areas in uh, Africa. And this is what CTIGH, the Tropical Poultry Genetic Solutions of ILRI, TPGS, are trying to do to ensure that we make business from these technologies. And of course, we mentioned we shouldn't be disseminating like that, but also what we have in the bar repository and gene banks is to support research and development. For functional genomic adaptations, explore the genetic material of this biobank uh, chicken. Uh, for functional annotation, gene expression data, protein structure, metabolite, et cetera. And to be able to produce whatever we want or whatever our community needs. So it is very important to know that it is possible to use this biobank material, apply the different tools that we have and produce through uh, genomic assisted breeding based improved line to produce these improved lines, which should be what our agroecology, our production systems, our farmer skills should be able to endorse and transform their lives. And since 2019, we have been trying to do this, of course, with support from AU IBA and with CALRO, this is the transfer of technology to the national system 
We have here our colleagues from Caldo working almost 100% time also, 80% uh, time at Ilri in the lab where the facilities are, but working on this different ecotype of Caldo that uh, we, we, saw, we saw earlier to ensure that the material is biobank and is supporting the development research for development or the different line that we saw from Caldo uh, in the previous slide. So thank you very much. This is exactly what we are trying to transfer also to Southern Africa. And we thank our different donors the FCDO, Bill and Melinda Gate, BBRC, uh, Jesse Overseer, and the CUB have been supporting it. We also thank the, top, the partners for the Center for Tropical Livestock Genetics and Health, and the local partners, TPGS, Calro, Africa Union, and the National uh, Center for the Replacement, Refinement, and Reduction, which is showing that it is possible, uh, instead of using live animals, which is very costly, difficult to maintain. For different experiments, we can still use the cells of those animals in petri dishes and obtain the same result that we want to produce. So thank you very much for your attention. And we hope that through that and with Hillary, we should be able to improve life of our key custodians of animal genetic resources. Thanks. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I wonder if we can take one question before we proceed. Yes, I think so. All right, so I think there is a, a question in the chat box. And I think this was uh, prompted by the presentation from Ferrari. And I don't know if Edgar wants to go or I'll just read it so that uh, we can move on. So Edgar is saying, because I think uh, uh, I had mentioned something about the, the lack of inability to, to bring some of the preserved animals back to life or to sustain them for a long time, they lose them. And Edgar is saying one of the, the problems that is facing African uh, Prior preservation of conservation of uh, genetic resources, the lack of genetics in uh, sorry expertise in genetics uh, that underpin some of these uh, activities, and I think his question is if there are efforts for regional postgraduate programs on conservation. I know you have uh, Christian mentioned a bit about uh, uh, capacity building efforts, uh, and I wonder if you can take on this and just to expand it more so that uh, Edgar can. Feel that his question has been answered. Yeah, regarding the capacity building, if all right. Yes. Yes, I, as I mentioned, uh, uh, and I, I wish Mary was there to present a bit what they put in place from AU and the AU IBA as regional gene banks. And uh, since uh, um, 2019, Ilri has been working with them to ensure that uh, uh, th these technologies develop between Ilori, CTLGH, Rosley Institute, et cetera, are transferred to the NAS. And this is how in 2019, we had the first training on biobanking here at Ilri. But uh, later on, there were also a few follow-up trainings uh, at the regional levels, particularly in countries which uh, determine poultry uh, chicken as their priority value chain for food security and poverty elevations. So we started the trainings, but uh, because of limited resources, that time was not possible to really uh, reach all the regions in Africa. But now with City Edge uh, phase two, we are extending this training and uh, uh, this capacity building we started with this uh, uh, webinar series, first to identify the key stakeholders within the regions. We did it in Southeast Asia. Uh, we did it also in East Africa last month. And this month we are working with Southern Africa. And the agenda, the objective is to make sure that from here we move to the wet lab training on biobanking and effective conservations of 
local animal genetic resources and local chicken genetic resources from the regions from what countries will have identified as farmer preferred breed or as priority breed for the uh, poultry local poultry industry. So this is a bit of what we are doing and we hope that using these technologies, we should be able to multiply the genetic resources within the regions and meet the demand. So I, I hope I'm bringing a, com uh, a supplement and a complementary information to, to the question that was sent. Yes, thank Christian. I guess the, 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 the challenge and back to the, to the question is the, the postgraduate programs, I don't think there is a capacity within say the city of GH to initiate a degree programs, if that's what the question oh. is about. But I guess when whatever most of these things are normally initiated based on needs, so like master's programs and stuff like that. And as the need, it's becoming more and more apparent that probably this is something that needs to be picked at at the national level. And when this becomes apparent, I think most of the local universities in collaborations with the partners abroad might have to start to think about having a postgraduate program. But I, I think at the moment, unless within individual projects like the one that uh, Mike McGrew is involved in, there wouldn't be like a national or a, a, an elaborate program to train postgraduate to train to start to train people at the postgraduate level on conservation and genetics of animal breeding. But there are there are wider programs within universities, both local within Africa and even here in Edinburgh on animal breeding and genetics, which then can then incorporate programs like. Uh, uh, conservation, but those will be within individual programs, like as I said, like the one that Tom, uh, sorry, Mike is running. All right, I think that that will be that, unless there is another any other. Yeah, we have a hand from Farah. Okay, sorry, Farah. Yeah, thanks, Mosa. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, I just want to to say as well, compliment to. <clears throat> to the other capacity that you did indicate, Christian, and also to the issue of covering the gap of postgraduate students having access to these technologies. One example that we have, and I've seen it in, in a number of NAS to say, you know, whilst the National Agricultural Research Institutions, they, they have the capacity and they have the resources in terms of biobanking and all that them partnering with universities and being able to train, to collaborate in training and capacity building of these postgraduate students is, is one model that can actually work. So for the Agricultural Research Council, we have a, what we call a professional development program where we bring postgraduate students from the university, then they have access to all the technologies that are at the NAS, and then they would still be able to undertake their postgraduate studies, whether it's an MSc or a PhD registered with the collaborating uh, university. Then that way resources are shared, the technologies can be accessed and the, and the students then have, you know, the ability to actually undertake and have capacity built in those applied research uh, programs. One thing that it also actually adds value to is them having the ability to access farming communities, which certain times universities might not have, but the NAS would have access to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for that clarification. We have uh, one more question from Paul, and uh, he's asking, are there currently elite locally adapted chicken populations to multiply through this technology? I think that is re in reference to your presentation, uh, Christian. Yeah, if there are elite populations to be cow preserved using these technologies. Yes, what CALRO is already doing. Of course, CALRO is crop preserving the locally adapted ecotypes of Kenya and from different counties, different challenging environments also. But CALRO has developed what they call the 
KC1, KC2, and now the KC3 lines, which are uh, dual purpose braid. And you may have seen in our presentation that they are also crop preserved to ensure that while we are moving from one generation to another, we are really, uh, we are keeping all the background informations and five years, 10 years later, we may have to go back and source some gene from the original population. So it is possible to have these elite populations. And I presented also the result from the Olivier's team from uh, Ethiopia, where through um, their mapping and their modeling, they are able to identify some locally adapted ecotypes it can be based on altitude and the temperature and the level of oxygen and adaptability or productivity in the regions. So this is one thing, a journey we need also to start to ensure that even if now we are still calling some of them local chicken, et cetera, some are really uh, already uh, identified like we have in Ethiopia, still in Ethiopia, the daisy chicken, the horo chicken, we have in South Africa, the Ovambo and the, uh, the other chicken that exist. We have in Nigeria, those breeds which are being uh, uh, through, uh, which uh, TPGS or ACGG, African G uh, Chicken Genetic Gain, has been working with Abiyokweta universities and others. So this can be preserved because some are already certified as breed or as line and released by the national authorities as a breed. So this can be car preserved using these technologies while we are still exploring uh, some others which are in the nature. Okay, thanks, Christian. Can I <clears throat> just ask one last question here for uh, Farai and uh, Christian? So Christian, you say there is a possibility to then take these technologies and apply them to other uh, regions and but I mentioned the idea of them having, you know, preservation uh, protocols that maybe sometimes don't work as well. What would be the limiting factor uh, for you, Christian, to transfer this technology to places like uh, where Farai is in South Africa? And Farai, from your point of view, what would be the bottlenecks in uh, absorbing such technologies for your systems? Uh, yeah, if maybe if I can start, yeah. I, I will say this uh, webinar today is uh, just the beginning of us transferring this technology to Southern Africa, including to uh, uh, Agriculture Research Council in South Africa to ensure that this uh, the technology can be used to crop preserve or to support the crop preservation effort that they have already they have already in place. Of course, when we are doing this, uh, we are doing within the limited budget that we have at URI, but uh, our for CTG AGH, but we just need to work together to mobilize more resources and ensure that the technology is fully transferred. In the next phase, uh, the next, the coming month, we will have to work with Farah and uh, Moriri and the others in Southern Africa to make sure that yes, we have effective wet lab training in Southern Africa, it can be in Botswana, it can be in South Africa, it can be in any other countries which is offering, which is having the, at least the minimum facilities. And we ensure that we have people equipped within the regions, trained as trainers to apply the technologies and really conserve. Then from there, we see how to escalate to few countries and to the whole regions. Probably we may also have to approach the uh, regional community, uh, economic communities and some other uh, instances in the regions to see how they can support the initiatives for us to fully transfer the technology to the ground. Yes, please. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Mos. So, uh, in terms of, I think, in terms of the challenges and the bottlenecks, I think uh, Christian has articulated that it's 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 capacity, it's 
its budget and you know this collaboration if you know the URI, the CTLGH can then roll out this this technology through trainer of trainers then that would really ensure that you know the impact reaches out to to every stakeholder not only in South Africa but I think Southern Africa and Africa is is a continent I think the advantage that comes is a lot of whether it's NAS or other research institutions they have some basic gemplasm uh, collection and conservation capacity. And so, you know, you can actually train people in their own countries and, you know, customizing it to, to meet their, their needs. But what I would see is a, is a bottleneck and not only, I think, for, for the continent, I think regardless of where you are, the diversity that we find in poultry genetic resources is, is huge and building the physical capacity to store that would, would be a challenge. And I think it goes to what, what Paul has alluded to in his earlier remarks, you know, the need to actually characterize this diversity and the need to know what's unique and what needs to be conserved and to prioritize what needs to be conserved. I think that needs to be done. Also, you know, as a, as a, as a biobanking or preservation unit, it's too prone to the risks that can be found. You know, this can be bent down, this can be destroyed, this can be affected by so many unknown factors. So there's, there's need for backup, there's need to make sure that we really have structures that complement each other, that back up each other, and that make sure that the resources are used efficiently. So in my point of view, we need to, 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 to protect ourselves or to ensure that we don't duplicate efforts, but we complement efforts that are happening at national level in terms of the preservation of any diversity that needs to be conserved. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's that's good to know because sometimes we move forward full straight without thinking what would be the challenges. Sometimes you need to carry those along with you as you're designing some of these things. I'll give it back to you, Christian, to proceed with the next uh, uh, set of speakers. Yeah, thank you very much, Musa. Uh, I don't know if Moreri has uh, fixed the issue of the um, microphone. Yeah, I think it should be fine now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Moreri. When you should be uh, loading your presentation, uh, allow me to introduce uh, you to the participant. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, thank you, thank you for facing that. Yes, uh, just give me a few minutes, few seconds to introduce you to uh, participants. So you are Dr. Tom Burden. Uh, he's uh, Tom is a group leader in the Division of Functional Genetics at the Rosling Institute, where he establishes his lab in the 2002, investigating the control of growth and differentiation of embryo-derived stem cells. And uh, he starts a research interest center on the regulation of growth and differentiation of pluripotent embryonic stem cells and uh, elucidating new mechanisms that uh, control cell renewal and pluripotency. And uh, currently his team continues these uh, basic studies and extending their work to developing novel stem cell system for directed differentiations and the functional analysis of genetic variations in livestock and wildlife species. So uh, today, Tom will be presenting on the, the potential uh, of pluripotent stem cells and uh, these technologies for conservations of uh, local animal genetic resources. So induce pluripotent stem cells as living cell bank for the studies and conservations of wildlife and domestic Anymore. Please, Tom, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. So can you see the full screen? Yes. Not... Uh, yeah, we can see. Can you put on full screen? I, I should have it. It's uh, um, you can see or can you just see the presentation? Can you see the presentation mode? We, we can see not on presentation mode. We see the Press that slide. button, Tom. You just missed it down there, down. I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm that's on, it's on my other screen. <laughs> so, um, 
Hmm. I wonder why that's because I didn't seem to have this problem before. Um, well, should I just carry on anyway? You can just uh, you can see the screen, can't you? Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's fine, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Well, I apologise for the confusion at the beginning. It seems to be my talks are cursed. I think the last <laughs> one. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I think I was stuck in a snowstorm in Minneapolis last time, and and wasn't able to get a presentation to you. And you can see the date on this is all wrong. So anyway, right. Well, thank you for inviting me, Christian. Um, and I have to say, I was very impressed by your talk about the surrogate chickens, um, because I suppose that was a beautiful demonstration of the conservation tools that can be developed. So. Um, our approach has been a little bit different. So I have to say that our work is really rather conservation light and is more focused on trying to develop systems to study the genetics and the molecular biology of livestock species. So this is what we have been working on for the last five or six years. It's a concept called what we call livestock in a dish. And the idea behind this is to basically using a sort of an NC3Rs type of approach to try and develop cell culture systems where we can study livestock biology essentially without having to do the animal experiments or at least complement the animal experiments. And so what you can see there are our, cell, our animals in a dish and a variety of cell types that one might be interested in trying to study. And the two sort of uh, scientific objectives under this are really what we'd like to use in cell culture systems, which are appropriate. We'd like to identify genes that underline uh, important livestock phenotypes. And also, um, we'd also like to understand and, and see if we can use the cells to model healthy and disease states in animals. And so basically, um, we've been trying to extend this Recent, more recently, um, to not only cover livestock cell, livestock species, but also um, we've had an opportunity to extend this to some wild species as well. And this is something I'm particularly interested in because I'm excited by the prospects of being able to understand, um, learn things about the interesting phenotypes and genetics of these wild species, some of which are, are the wild, essentially, sisters of the of the domesticated species so we can understand something about domestication but we can also understand things about their particular phenotypes that these wild animals have so this is what we've been working on for the last two or three years i would say and the outputs um, that we hope to develop from this approach are essentially twofold um, well the main output is that we can generate a living biological resource so this is a, a resource that we can share with other people and people can use it in other labs. And the really, the sort of priority for us at the moment is trying to use them to understand the science, to understand the biology of both domesticated and wild species. What we would like to do in the future is also ex uh, expand this to using these uh, cell types that we regenerate also um, to, play a role in conservation of particularly wild species. That's something that I would uh, dream about. So the kind of scientific questions that we think are interesting that we could address, and I'm sure there, there are more than this, but these are the ones that have come to mind but in terms of being able to do this kind of comparative biology, comparing both domesticated and the wild species, is really to understand more deeply what the relationship is between the genes and the phenotype. And the outputs that we think are useful are understanding animal health generally. So understanding disease susceptibility and resistance. And this can apply both to the wild animals as well as the domesticated. We can understand more about how to improve livestock productivity because domestication in some cases has been a loss of phenotype or a loss of genetics as well as the gain of um, productivity potentially. Um, we're also interested in understanding the genetics of environmental adaptation and domestication. And finally, where we'd like to go, and we aren't there yet, um, but I think the field is rapidly developing, and that is how to use conservation and reproductive technologies to 
make use of this living uh, uh, biobank essentially and end up with an archive essentially of the genetic diversity that is present in both wild and domesticated species. So the cornerstone of all of this work, and this is really, an, I, I mean, I think it's been mentioned several times in, in a number of these talks today, is really getting hold of and being able to archive living cells. This is absolutely critical, whether they're PGCs or even in case, some cases, just biopsy material or other reproductive tissues. But the cr crucial thing is really getting living cells. Having the genetic code for an animal is interesting and useful, but essentially is not much use if, you, if the cells, if the animals are gone. So we really need to archive the cells. So basically the procedure that we're working on is basically to be able to get cells from live tissue biopsies can establish primary cultures, those are those things here, and then expand them into a population of cells that can then be archived and safely frozen down. The problem for a lot of the somatic cells that one could do this with, for example, fibroblasts, is although you can preserve them like this, and they, 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 but they have a limited lifespan. So this is an absolute key problem. Um, they also will tend to dis display really just the phenotype of, the, of that cell type. So essentially you're limited in terms of the kind of biological questions you can ask. And also because of limited time lifespan, they're actually quite, they're very difficult to uh, do sophisticated genetic manipulations because basically you can't expand them for long enough to actually study them. So our approach to get around this is essentially to harness uh, a stem cell technology that was invented probably more than 40 years ago and, and harness pluripotency, really. And so this uh, slide just shows that here. So essentially, this is a technology that was invented 40 years ago. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. So basically, if you take a mouse, take um, the embryo from a mouse, the blastocyst, then what was shown a long time ago was that you could basically, if you got the conditions right, you could grow this small patch of cells here, the inner cell mass, out in culture and create immortal cultures of cells that last forever, essentially. And this is what this is here. This is, a, this is a colony of embryonic stem cells, probably several hundreds of cells there. And the beauty is that if this system, and the quite extraordinary thing about them, is that you can grow them essentially forever. They have a natural immortality, uh, or, um, they have the capacity for this. And you can basically then in vitro, you can differentiate them if you change their growth conditions so that it promotes differentiation, you can convert them into a variety. In fact, in theory, into all the fetal tissues that are generated during development from a blastocyst. But the most remarkable thing was that these cells, even though you could keep them in culture and you could genetically manipulate them in the mouse at least, when you reintroduce them into an embryo, they would recolonize the animal, the fetus, and give rise essentially to an animal which could transmit the ESLs through the germline. So basically, despite being in culture for such a long time, this natural immortality is relatively stable and retains the capacity for, pluripot for differentiation, what we call pluripotency. So essentially, they represent an unlimited resource of differentiated cells or, or stem cells and the differentiated cells. So this was developed in mouse more than 40 years ago. And our ambition was really to use this technology um, as best we could in, in, in livestock species. However, there's another technology which I just want to touch on, which really is central to our work, which was an invention that was made around about 2006, I think it was, from ya uh, ya Yamanaka's lab in Japan, where they discovered a way of converting somatic cells back into this embryonic state. So basically what they showed was that you could take a tissue biopsy, you could grow the cells from it, and then by treating the cells, those somatic cells with stem cell factors, you could basically rewind them back to the embryonic state. And that's what's called an induced pluripotent stem cell, it's IPS reprogramming. And those cells, now that they've been wound back to a stem cell state are now immortal. So you can grow these forever essentially. And what they can do is essentially provide an unlimited source for a variety of 
progenitor cells that are generated normally during embryonic development, and then a whole host of embryonic differentiated cells that one can produce. So this is a key technology for us. This ability to be able to take a somatic cell, so it could be from a skin patch of skin or whatever, and be able to basically reprogram back to the stem cell state and then basically bank them as a mortal cell line. So just as an example of the kind of experiment we've done in the lab, here's a process. This is far more exciting in the animation, but unfortunately I don't have that um, here. Uh, here we have an animal. This is a Red River hog that we got a tiny patch of skin cells from an operation that the Red River hog was undergoing at a local zoo. Uh, we took the tissue, we then explanted this tissue into culture, and we generated uh, cultures of fibroblast cells. Now these fibroblast cells would normally grow for only say 10, 20 passages, but when we took them, we took, got them early enough, we then reprogrammed them with the stem cell factors and generated these cultures of IPS cells. So this is, again, this is a colony here of the Red River hog IPS cells. There's hundreds of cells there. They grow very tight in that cluster. And essentially, then we could use those, we could expand them, bank them, freeze them down, and then we could at will, whenever we thawed them, we could then create a variety of different cell types from those. Red River hog cells. So essentially, this animal that we took the cell that, that we took this tiny little bit of tissue from during it was getting castrated, unfortunately for it, um, that is still running around in the zoo. It's perfectly alive while we are experimenting on the cells in the in the lab. So what I can show, hopefully these videos will show you. So this is just a, an illustration in this slide of the functionality of the cells that we have. So hopefully you will see a video. So basically what we have here, this is something that we get in there, some of our cultures when they're differentiating. Um, these are some uh, electrically coupled cardiomyocytes. So I hope you can see that. And you can see the, the beating of the cells. So these are spontaneously patched of cardiomyocytes that came from the Red River hog. So essentially we're making heart in vitro. The other example here, is where we've taken the cells and we've pushed them down um, to make hematopoietic cells or blood cells, and then we differentiated them into macrophages. And so this video here is a field of macrophages that we've generated from the red river hog uh, tissue, uh, iPS cells. And we then incubated those cells with uh, little particles that essentially, when they get ingested or phagocytosed by the macrophages, which of course are very active phagocytes, those particles then change their color into a fluorescent red when they get ingested into an acidic environment, such as the lysosome or phagosome. So that what you'll see, hopefully, as the video runs and the cells move around, they become increasingly fluorescent. And you can see the red cells there. So it's showing that they're very active, what we think are normal macrophages. OK. So now I'm just going to tell you about a project which we have got undergoing in the lab, which is maybe closer to many, sometime, some of yours interests. And that is really uh, of a, a disease that's of great concern, not only in Africa, but also across the world and particularly in Asia recently where it caused a major problem for uh, pig farming. So that's African swine fever virus. And so the heart of this is that Domesticated pigs are killed very, very quickly by African swine fever virus. They basically have a massive hemorrhagic fever and the pigs are killed within seven to 10 days. However, in Africa, many of the wild pigs or wild sewage, I should say, they're not pigs, strictly speaking, are capable of carrying the virus, they get infected, but they're tolerant of African swine fever virus. So the sort of archetypal example of this is this beast here, the warthog. And so we are interested in really, what is it about the warthog genetics, which allows it to coexist with the virus, whereas the domesticated pig gets so ill. And that was uh, something that we're really interested in trying to understand. And so essentially what a uh, PhD student Tom Watson in the lab did is he derived a number of iPS cells. So these are stem cell lines from 
fibroblast cultures that we've isolated from a variety of different pigs. So here we have a domesticated pig, and these little colonies here are the pig iPS cells. We have, we got a bit of a sample of a wild boar, which is essentially a wild version of the domesticated pig. It's the same species. And you can see here's a little colony of the wild boar iPS cells that Tom made. We have some Red River hog iPS cells here. And also more recently, very recently, we started making some iPS cells from wart hog. These are lagging somewhat behind, so we don't actually have them quite at the same stage. But essentially, these three types we've been working on in the lab for quite some time. And so essentially, the experiment, I'm not going to show you any data yet because it's still work under underway. But essentially, what we do is we take iPS cells from those two different species. We then convert them into macrophages. Now, macrophages are the normal natural host for African swine fever virus. And so with our collaborators down at APHA or in the Purbright Institute down near Sur in Surrey, they do that the ASFE infections for us because it's SAPO4, we can't do them ourselves. And we're basically looking at how infective are the cells, what's the host cell responses to infection, and really can we understand something about the genetics underlying disease resistance it, as it pertains to macrophages. That's making an assumption that some of the bio important biology is happening in the cells that the ASFE infects. So that's the status of those experiments. So really back to our outputs and impact, we think that comparing domesticated species and wild species has a lot going for it in terms of understanding the comparative biology or the genetics underpinning the differences between these species. Our focus at the moment is very much on science, i.e. the sort of understanding molecular genetics and the genetics basis of some of the differences. However, in the future, of course, um, in the same way that PGCs can be used in reproduction, um, there are protocols now available for mouse stem cells, and I'm talking about pluripotent stem cells, where one can make gametes from those stem cells. This is a, a technology that's very much in its infancy in terms of other species, but it's something that is probably going to be the future. That, so that, that basically these embryonic stem cells or IPS cells are going to be a potential resource for generating gametes and therefore um, archiving animals essentially in, in a freezer. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom, for this uh, presentation, which is really showing us how it, important it is to use these stem cells technologies. And I'm sure it's giving ideas also to the end users and the national systems, particularly these aspects of uh, in vitro spermatogenesis that you mentioned at the end, and how we can be just using skin snips and collecting fibroblasts, inducing pluripotency and differentiating them into any type of cells, any type of material we want for our different experiment. And this is why it is really called uh, large talk in the dish. And it's important. It is in the line of the 3R research. And it means uh, cutting down the cost of experimentations, the cost of conservations, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you very much, Tom, for that wonderful presentations. I don't know if you have uh, Musa, do we have questions? No? Uh, no, we don't have questions at the moment, but I, I think what I will just highlight for the people, you know, we look at this from the, the point of view as in conservation of uh, African national genetic resources, but you can see from Tom's uh, talk that there is also potential to exploit the, the genetic resources in Africa to understand some of these complex issues like animal resistance to, to, to diseases and, and Africa would probably have some of these uh, uh, exotic uh, uh, species that actually are more resistant to some of these emerging pathogens and if we can with things like the technologies that Tom has uh, just highlighted we can generate resources from them that can be used also not just in preservation but also to understand some of the long long term long term uh, standing issues in uh, 
in disease uh, pathogenesis. Yeah. Back, Morris, are you getting us now very well? Okay, let me try it again. Yes, please. Yeah. Does it appear over there? Still not, no. Oh, that's where the problem is now. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe you can share that with uh, myself or Musa and he will be able to load on your behalf. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, in the meantime, maybe Hamad could step in. Yes, yes. And uh, make be his good. presentation. Yeah, because I, I also have to leave at half past to get a train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please, thank you. Well, then now, now it works on my side. Yeah. Okay. So you should... Wonderful, you can put it on that. presentation mode. Yes. Okay. Excellent, yeah. Great. Yes, please, uh, Amor, thank you. And uh, thank you, a very time, taking time to be with us and to... Uh, show us the importance of access and benefit sharing because all this material we are talking about, the cells from the different uh, researchers, mm -hmm. the animal genetic resources in the region is to support research. It means it can easily be moving from South Africa to Botswana to Malawi, Zimbabwe, etc. And we need to be complying. So for me to introduce you to participants, uh, Hamot. Uh, Hamot is uh, work as senior advisor for the multi uh, multi donor global project ABS Capacity Development Initiative, implemented by GIZ since 2013. And Hamot support uh, African partners countries in the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol. For example, we have the development of institutional and administrative framework, negotiation of ABS contract enabling the participations of indigenous people and local community who are the real custodians of these genetic resources in the access and benefit sharing process and also supporting biodiversity-based value chains. Yeah. So Hamot advises the German uh, Federal Ministry of Development and Economic Cooperation as well as international and regional organizations like uh, AU, uh, AU commissions, AUI, but the regional economic communities on access and benefit sharing issues. And uh, Ahmad followed the international ABS discussion since uh, 2019, 1998. Yes, and he has been supporting a lot of projects. He studied biology and specialized in plant biochemistry and molecular biology and for his diploma and PhD thesis at the German University of uh, Göttingen. And in his postdoc position, he focused on soil microbiology and biochemistry in the German Center for Forest Ecosystem Research. So while talking about the regulatory and the policy aspect, Hamad also fully understand the fundamentals of biology and the importance of using this material. So please, Hamad, you have the floor to discuss and share with us the regional strategy for conservation of local animal genetic resources on the on the pathway for access and benefit sharing mm. uh, Nagoya protocol compliance for animal genetic resources. Thank you very much, Amot. You have the floor. Yes. Thanks a lot, Tristan, for inviting me and then uh, continuing our now long standing cooperation with ILRI and the various projects you have. Well, I'm I, I will be brief and just um, give an overview about um, applicable ABS frameworks and ABS uh, obligations um, to your projects. While I'm, I'm, I'm not going into detail, but just actually giving an overview. And then of course, um, we could then see how, how it um, will work out in, in actually accessing these resources. Um, I would just like to remind you of the Convention of Biological Diversity, um, which was um, adopted in 92 already. Uh, and of course, now it has a Nagoya Protocol um, adopted in 2010, which specifies the third aim of this convention. And that is 
uh, what in terms of ABS is important. The first aim is the conservation of biological diversity, second, the sustainable use of its component, and the third aim is the fair and equitable sharing of benefits from the utilization of genetic resources. And there are um, the convention um, links this to three very distinct um, yeah, topics, issues. First, there should be appropriate access to genetic resources by the providing countries. And there, it is linked to the appropriate transfer of technology and know-how by the user. Um, and uh, then it comes to the more uh, monetary side of beneficiary, there should be appropriate funding like upfront payments, milestone payments or license fees and royalties that especially of course refers to more um, commercial research um, than um, yeah, basic research or, or university research. So this is a policy framework against, um, I like to discuss uh, the topics today. The Nagoya protocol then specifies a bit more um, what it is about. Um, so it says um, the genetic resources um, have to be um, on the territory of the member states and um, it is the benefits arising from the utilization of such resources, which then triggers um, the benefit sharing obligation. And genetic resources actually means any material of biological origin that contains um, genetic elements, DNA, etc. So also stem cells, for example, in, 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 in your uh, area of research or blood samples with a very broad, um, broad definition of what genetic resources are. Um, also, and that might, I don't know, that might not actually um, fit to your project. And the Nagoya Protocol also says if researchers access associated traditional knowledge that uh, um, is actually connected with the use of re genetic resources and, and deeper knowledge about it, then also um, the access and benefit sharing rules would apply. Um, and it defines what actually utilization is because the, the Convention of Biological Diversity doesn't specify that. So the Nagoya Protocol says that um, the utilization is any research and development on genetic and or biochemical composition of the genetic resource. And I think this um, then will fully apply to um, a lot, and if not all, research projects um, under the Hillary roof, because you are actually looking into genetics, uh, you do breeding, et cetera. Um, that is um, so the all under the your protocol scope, and thus, of course, um, also under national legislation, which, of course, has to be adopted. So what, what are the um, general issues for, for ILRI and all uh, connected projects? Um, of course, it is that, that um, the research on genetic resources on breeding is ongoing. And as we see in the last yeah, many years, um, it is uh, very much uh, on genetics, um, on uh, molecular technologies, on what we now call the digital sequence information, on sequencing genomes and, and using data, et cetera. Um, what uh, what um, are you doing? You Many researchers have the understanding, of course, that wild animal, wild genetic resources would be under the Nagoya protocol, under the CBD. And many think that if you use um, domesticated animals, um, which in most cases are actually privately owned by farmers, um, the ABS rules are not applying, um, which uh, actually is not true. Because the Nagoya protocol first doesn't differentiate between public and private genetic resources. So it's any genetic resource, whether it belongs to the state in protected area or whether it belongs to a farmer. And then when you come from the agriculture field, as many of you do, 
Um, you uh, often refer to this international treaty on plant genetic resources, which has um, a certain list of plant genetic resources, which are exempt from the Nagoya system. Um, but this actually only refers to these plants. And uh, we don't have any international agreement on access and benefit sharing with regard to animal genetic resources, which are used for food and agriculture culture. So by default, all these cows and chicken and pigs and whatever you like to access and do a research on, by default, they are under the national ABS system um, developed by the Nagoya Protocol and meaning that in first case, they are usually under uh, environmental ministries, which um, is not exactly those ministries uh, which you are in contact with, because usually you work with agriculture ministry. And that, in the end, and this is what we know from the practice of a lot of ILRI projects, poses a significant challenge to the scientific practice, because you suddenly need to work with other ministries than you are used to. Um, as I said, the Nagoya Protocol and the Convention of Biological Diversity set the international legal framework, but these international laws are not applicable to the activities of institutions, of, of persons, etc. Um, only when countries um, adopt and then implement national ABS regulation, there is a legal obligation then to comply with these regulations in the respective countries. And um, I would like two handful or a bit more African countries actually um, have ABS regulations or ABS laws. Um, I just listed some of them, uh, Benin, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Kenya, Madagascar, Malawi, Namibia, Uganda, South Africa. Um, there are some more, and in some countries, these laws are in the, under development. So if you want to source um, your samples um, from those countries, you need to go through the respective ABS regulation, meaning you need a prior informed consent, you need to do an ABS contract that specifies the benefit sharing, and you need an ABS permit. Um, but the Nagoya Protocol not only regulates access to resources, uh, it also sets up an international compliance system. So because um, if you, for example, if you source the resource in Kenya and you undertake the research outside of Kenya, um, of course, um, all the regulations in Kenya, they don't apply. Yeah, and uh, that was a problem for a lot of these provider countries that they they had their national regulations. But when, for example, um, the research was undertaken in the UK, which is um, the case in several of the projects under the Hillary roof, um, um, Kenya didn't have any any um, possibility really to interfere with that, to ask for the benefits, etc. That changed with the Nagoya Protocol. And um, the EU um, developed ABS compliance regulations, which says that um, any user in the EU uh, who uses genetic resources from a country with ABS regulation must prove the legal access. So they must be able to show all the documents. Um, that regulation was done when the UK was still in the EU. Now, when it's separate, it kept their rules. Also in the UK, there is ABS compliance as a compulsory um, requirement, and Norway and Switzerland have similar rules. Um, until now, um, African countries, uh, although they went for access regulations, usually don't have compliance parts in these regulations. So their countries wouldn't ask for compliance with ABS regulations in their, let's say, neighbor countries. But when you go to Europe or UK, you need to be able to show that. 
And especially, and I think this is something which um, is important also for um, projects uh, of your kind is um, it, the Nagoya protocol doesn't deal with ex situ collections directly. But it's um, the EU guidance on their compliance regulations say that, um, I, I just copied the legal text, which essentially says that if you um, access genetic resources in an ex situ collection, and when the genetic resources in this G2 ex situ collections have been actually collected in the country of the collection. So that is, for example, the collections at Ilri, if the samples in those ex situ collections were collected in Kenya, there are also many others, which I know, then you actually, when you access them now in the Ilri collection, it is seen, at least by the EU, as an access to a resource from Kenya regardless when it was collected. So um, you still need to have a Kenyan ABS documents if you go, if you get Kenyan genetic resources from an ex situ collection in Kenya. That would also apply to all other countries when you look at it from the um, view of the European ABS guidance. That is something also um, projects have to be aware of, and also the institutions running these ex situ collections. So to make a final um, uh, final summary of all that, um, it is that, um, and I'm, this might it might sound a bit drastic, but I think that's actually the reality, um, um, which uh, universities and other institutions are facing now. That usually, if a country has ABS legislation and uh, requires the prior informed consent, the ABS contract and the permit, um, any violation of these uh, laws or regulations are usually seen as a crime. So that um, might uh, bring you in, in some problems if you don't follow these ABS legislations. And then also I referred to the compliance regulation in the EU, meaning if, if you go to the EU with samples where you should have ABS documents and you don't have them, um, that research is regarded as illegal. And there have been cases reported that researchers from Africa were sent back because they arrived at European universities with samples, for example, from Kenya, um, where they didn't have the appropriate documents. And that is something you also need to uh, contemplate and and, um, and and Ilri spent a lot of work on that and, and develop protocols, et cetera, to guarantee that the research actually is legal. Um, and it, uh, in, it also has a second angle, um, also the commercialization of products from such illegal utilization would be illegal in the EU. So meaning, um, and I don't know whether that is the intention of your projects, but that was the intention of other projects, which we worked together. Um, the, if commercialization of products would happen in the EU, also these companies, which are doing the commercialization, they also need to be able to prove that the original access and the, the research was actually under ABS rules. That's a quite um, demanding legal framework from both sides. Um, we see that also other countries um, are in the process of updating their ABS legislation. Um, and I think it's just um, fair to say that um, public and private entities, also the companies um, involved in, let's say in your case, breeding, just must adapt to these new legal environments to keep the standards and reputation and to be able in the end to do their business. Um, although in the beginning I was, uh, let's say, a bit hard on telling you that a lot of countries see this as a crime or as an offense, but in practice it is um, the case, and we know of examples of that, that um, if there is uh, illegal access, if there was research not complying with the rules, a lot of countries 
are not really interested in bringing this to court or whatever, because a lot of countries, of course, know about the value of research um, and the value of cooperation. So usually um, it is it is possibly and also welcome um, to also in perspective um, get the ABS Act documents and negotiate the contracts to make non-compliant research compliant because um, and I think this is uh, also a good development in the last last years that countries um, see actually the value in producing corporations and research. Well, that's a um, pretty brief um, introduction in this topic. Um, what I what I um, like to yeah underline and and this I think is a very uh, good development is that. Um, we cooperated with ILRI since a very long time, and this resulted in, in um, uh, yeah, a good awareness of ILRI in, in uh, processes and rules um, to ensure that uh, this, um, these challenges of ABS, especially when you go to many and different countries, um, are actually met and that uh, research can um, proceed um, in, in a smooth way. So and that, that is where we also like to continue our cooperation with ILRI and ILRI's partners to, to secure that um, research and breeding and uh, actually in the end, the sustainable use of genetic resources will continue in Africa and also for Africa, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hamad. Not, yes for the wonderful presentations and awareness. And thank you also for standing on our side, seeing so long and working with us on the different steps that we have been trying to make on compliance and uh, making sure that all the access that genetic resources for research and development that we are doing are really complying to the national and international framework uh, regarding the as for the access and benefit sharing mm -hmm. and it is very important uh, what you are also presenting here today for our partners national partners and regional partners from southern africa to understand that for these genetic resources to benefit to the local communities where the custodians who have been keeping them for us we need to also ensure that we researchers, we are complying, that the partners are also complying. And this is through the national systems, of course. Yes. And if any time we have challenges in the countries, we can still reach uh, uh, references like Hamlet and uh, other partners like Iri, which can still be introducing you to those who should be able to advise on the approach to make sure that the benefits are really shared by the users and the providers of genetic resources. So thank you very much. And on that, we really hope that we should be able to work together with the national partners and the regional partners in Southern Africa to access first on the genetic resources to support the different research that Musa, Tom, and everybody will be doing in collaboration with you in the regions and also how preserving that genetic material that was, will be serving the future generations. So thank you, Amat. And uh, 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 I don't know, Mureri, you share your presentation with uh, Musa and my, or myself. If that I, is I did done. with you. Ah, okay. So yeah. let me open it, then I will... Okay, then I will display it and yeah. uh, lead for you, right? Yes, and I'm, I, I would like to say goodbye because I need to catch my train back to Frankfurt. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Howard. Yes, so I sent you my presentation. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Wish you a further good webinar and a fruitful cooperation. So we see us soon in Nairobi. Uh, thank you, thank you. Okay. We meet very soon in Nairobi. 
and yes. uh, have a nice trip back to Frankfurt. Yes, thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. So let me try to share the screen from Moreri. Can you see it? It's a PowerPoint document. Can you see it? Yes, it's there. Okay, good. So um, since I've already presented you, so you can just uh, take the floor and we, I will be moving on your behalf. Moving the slide on my behalf. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'd like to introduce I'm Udwana Moreri from the Department of Agricultural Research. Uh, I'll be giving just an overview of uh, the status of uh, animal genetic resources and conservation in the Intersidic region. Can you move to the next slide? So SADC has a diversity of uh, the genetic resources. Uh, in fact, it's one of the most diverse regions of Africa. So these uh, genetic resources provide um, uh, several purposes, including uh, Hello. Have we lost Moderi again? Yeah, I think his connection has dropped. Just to... Oh, that is, um... yeah. Yeah, it's not at least a serious problem. It's a common problem in many of our countries, so. Let's hope uh, he join again. In the meantime, maybe we can be, Musa, I don't know if there is any comment on the questions regarding the access and benefit sharing or what have been said before. We are waiting for more to join. At the moment, there are no questions and I think uh, uh, the presentation was a bit comprehensive, I guess. The, uh, the the confusion has always been how to move materials between countries, and I think that was adequately covered. I don't know if anyone has any comments or anything they'd like to add, but at the moment, there's no question in the Q&A or the comment section. Okay. So... Yeah, are you able to see if Moreri is back or not? No, I think he's around. I think he's uh, the problem. The problem is, is he actually no, he's not around. I thought it was just the sound system drop. No, he's not here. So, so Tom's hand is up. Tom, do you have something you want to say? Yeah, I've got something provocative to say. Yes, please. Okay. So ABS, access. Yeah. The, the problem is that the real issue that everybody feels about this is that access seems to be the least effective part of this whole thing. Um, there's a very real concentration on protecting the benefits. And my concern is a little bit is that there seem to be quite a lot of countries in the world that are not signed up to Nagoya. Yeah. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. Uh, I would say that some of the big ones, such as USA, as far as I understand, does not sign up. Yeah, um, yes. I'm not sure whether China does. I Do they guess. sign up? Yes, China has a system. Has a compliance. system, but doesn't sign up to Nagoya. Uh, not so sure. I mean, so, so in South America, Brazil, for example, they signed up. Yes. Okay. So, so the problem is that, that that science moves on, and while people are pushing bits of paper around, a lot of the ideas and experiments become redundant because they basically get done elsewhere. And I think what really need what really is very very important is that. ABS or Nagoya, whatever you want to call it, has to be 
efficient and quick because science doesn't sit still. And I think the benefits will be lost if there's no, if it's not made an efficient and effective um, procedure because essentially things become redundant once other, other countries have done them. Um, so I think it's really, really, um, I think it, 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 it clearly Nagoya has got very good ideas behind it, but unless the implementation is, is done swiftly, then people, you know, researchers get tired and eventually we'll just not do the experiments. They have to look for something because we, we live in short-term grant rounds, yes? So we cannot wait for things. Um, so I think Absolutely. it's really, really important that this procedure becomes a matter of months, but, but it can take years. And, and, and it is a source of frustration for many people who are, we have good idea, you know, we want to improve the welfare of, of, of people across the world. We want to do the experiments because we think there's some benefit. But if, if we can't get access, quick access, to samples and, and things, then those experiments get completely worthless. Absolutely. So I, I, yeah. but my experience is that it doesn't happen that's, quickly. That's all right, Tom. I think the the challenge is, uh, is always the balance between speed and uh, compliance. But as you pointed out in the list of your countries that haven't signed up to the Nagoya, you might quickly realize they have nothing to be exploited or they have, but I think you, your point is, is valid. The challenge has always been, I think most of this have been developed most of the times very quickly and with no thought on how to, they are going to be implemented. But I think with the time it's getting better and better. And yeah, no, I'm sure it is. It's just, it, it can only improve going forward, but I, yeah, your point is is valid. As in, you know, you, you don't want people, you don't want to stop people from. But there was the also the other point is I think if you think of the genesis of of the things that made the Nagoya Protocol necessary, it was the idea that someone could just fly in, have some people collect some DNA for them then it disappears and you never hear about it. Yeah. Unless you can access some journal where you will see that DNA you collected was used in some study. Sure. And you were not even cited in that study. So it, like it wasn't necessary. And even sometimes when there was an attempt to, to actually acknowledge the source of it, it was mainly a, a technical source. There was actually nothing to do with the intellectual input that can then, you know, just like your stem cells, if I took your stem cells and used them for something and never acknowledged that you generated them, you'll be pretty pissed. Yeah, but I, I understand. But actually, in reality is that, um, I guess you're right. I mean, the le legal people would definitely hold on to that. But I mean, I have to say that most people's react, you know, in science, usually what happens is you share it out, you get a couple of acknowledgements, but once it's out there in the academic environment, things move fast because people have access. Yeah. Um, the protective um, nature of Nagoya and ABS is that it slows things down so much yeah. that people outside it are, are just racing ahead. And, you know, that really just become, and in the meantime, some of the resources are disappearing. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, not, it's, not, it's not a joke that um, environments are actually just disappearing. The animals that we were interested in, you know, saving <laughs> have got nowhere to live. Yeah. So it, it, I, I, I do understand. I mean, the, the sort of imperialistic model of going places and, and, and sort of harvesting stuff it, yeah. it is, 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 is a painful one, and I, I think that's wrong. But on the other hand, oh, if one makes it overly officious and overly um, complex, then um, it can it can just people just go elsewhere. Yeah, I guess it is not something we can find an answer to. But 
now, but I think it's what it's, yeah, we, we I think most of the times we just try to understand the reasons behind some of these things, but sure, I agree sure. with you, it is, it is much more nuanced and complex than that. But I guess you also have to think about it, that that is the only resource those countries have. The other people have the money and the technology and everything. And so it needs to, they decide, okay, you have the technology, you have the money, we have the resources. How about we make it a better trade where we all benefit rather than- Absolutely, absolutely, just, I agree, completely. You just take what you want and leave us alone, but- No, sure, sure. Point. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know if uh, the others, the speaker is back or they're still lost. Otherwise, we might have just to move on, Christian. Yes, I think uh, if we can have him back, yeah, we just have to move on. Yeah. And uh, and uh, only what now is for me uh, to thank everybody who has been here, who took time to attend and to exchange on this. And for mm -hmm. our friend from uh, Southern mm -hmm. Africa, that is just the beginning of the journey. And as... Uh, uh, Tom was mentioning there will be no benefit if there is no access to genetic resources. So working all together, it's to support that we have, we comply of course, but that scientists have access to genetic resources to produce the materials, the good that will be used to improve livelihood and sometimes even to tell communities what they really have what's the usefulness, what's the richness of the genetic material that we have. So we'll be, head, we'll be reaching out the partners in the regions, the presenters here and the participants and some other partners in the region to see how we can be planning for the web lab training on the Pramodza gem cells or the reportant stem cells as well and to make sure that we have effective conservation of the ground. And this is to support the work that Tom is doing on mammals for conservations, to support what uh, Musa is doing on the, using the stem cells for, to explore uh, the, or the diversity and to harness the potentials of using that to improve livelihood and what so many other scientists in the regions or international partners in the advanced research institutions may be needing to ensure that we have that benefit coming uh, to the to the communities, local communities or populations and to science, global science community as well. So I will just uh, return to you, Musa, to say the last word and to close the webinar. So thank you, everyone.